I don't know why. Every time I see this font used on Tamiya models, I keep thinking of the Godfather. And well, like the Godfather, for this model here, I was given an offer I really couldn't refuse. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German World War II Jagd Panther tank destroyer. The model that we see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box, however I went ahead and added some extra aftermarket upgrades to it, bringing it to the condition that we have here. In this video we're going to be going over all of this information as well as giving this model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bit of content coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the German World War II SDKFZ 173, also known as the Jagd Panther. This vehicle here is a German tank destroyer and this vehicle was developed in 1943 and entered into service around that time and was in production and saw service with the German military all the way up to the end of the war in 1945. This vehicle had one job and one job only and that was to go out and knock out enemy armor, specifically enemy armor at distant ranges. The Germans tried this type of a approach with the same type of high velocity anti-tank armament with two previous examples, one of which was the Ferdinand and the Elephant, and the other was the Nassworm. Both of these vehicles had their own problems, however, the idea was one that was a viable one. The problems with the Ferdinand and Elephant, amongst a litany of other things, was that they were deemed to be just too heavy and also just unreliable for the task at hand. The Nashorn, however, was a much more reliable platform, however, that vehicle was based on a Panzer IV and, and was a completely open type casemate design and with this design this left this vehicle to be very vulnerable from enemy infantry attacks the yag panther was going to be a way to solve this problem for the vehicle's platform it was going to be utilizing the panther chassis the panther and the yag panther share everything in common from suspension up to the drivetrain this would include the exact same transmission and also the exact same maybach hl230 cyclone v12 gasoline engine where the Yag Panther, of course, was going to differ was with the upper hull. Unlike the Panther, which had a fully revolving turret, the Yag Panther was going to incorporate a casemate design that had limited transverse and elevation compared to a turreted version. However, remember, this vehicle was meant to stay back and just pick off enemy armored range, so the idea of the turret wasn't really that necessary. One feature that the Elephant carried over or I should say one lesson learned from the elephant that carried over into the Jagd Panther was with the Bow MG. This was something that bit the Germans in Kursk with the Ferdinand, and on the Jagd Panther over here, it was going to have a secondary armament of a ball-mounted MG34 TMG. For the main armament, the vehicle is going to utilize the 8.8 centimeter high velocity anti tank armament. This unit here was more than capable of knocking out just about anything that the Allies had at that given time, and was also more than capable of doing a number on several of the new vehicles that were on the drawing boards at the same time as well, specifically in the US, the UK, and even with the Soviet Union. This armament would later be the main armament on the King Tiger, however, that's of course another story for another day. Regardless, this vehicle armed with this high velocity armament here would definitely not be something that you want to encounter if you're rolling around in a Sherman or a T-34. And unlike the Nashorn, which had an open type casemate design with very thin armor protection, the Yag Panther over here was going to have much better armor protection for the crew, and the crew was going to be housed in an entirely enclosed space. The vehicle had excellent angled armor plates, along with combined with their thickness, really gave this vehicle quite adequate protection from most threats. The vehicle weighed in at about 45 tons and about 400 and some odd units were produced in total. The Yang Panther is very unique because it's one of those World War II German vehicles that had continued into production briefly after the war. You see, after World War II, there were a few hulls and parts that were remaining from the leftover factories that were overtaken by the Allies, and these vehicles were built up into completed vehicles specifically for the Allies so that they can perform some testing and evaluation on this platform of vehicle. Currently, there are known to be seven examples of surviving Yag Panthers that are still in existence today, all of which are housed in various military museums across the world, from the U.S., 
Great Britain, as well as also in Europe. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale second generation Tamiya Yag Panther kit. This model here is a really recent addition to the stash where I picked it up about six months ago and it hasn't been in the shop nearly long enough to collect any shelf dust as you can see. The model was procured off of eBay and I'll touch upon that once I actually crack into the box. The second generation Yag Panther is a kit that I've been wanting to do a video review on for a little while now. A little while ago I completed a first generation Yag Panther Tamiya kit that was a OTR rebuild and in that video I stated that Tamiya first designed a Yag Panther kit in the 1970s time frame. That version was considered to be an early production Yag Panther and that kit stayed in production for a long period of time, only being replaced and eventually phased out by the mid to late 1990s time frame. As I touched upon in a number of my videos, the 1990s was really a low point in the armor modeling hobby. There were really two big companies on the scene at the time, which would have been Tamiya and Italeri. Some other companies that were noteworthy were Academy and Dragon, and both of those were really taking the tooling from either of those companies and polishing them up and making them more of their own. Dragon most notably did this with kits from Italeri, and Academy was doing this with kits from Tamiya. Well, as for the two main companies themselves, they were basically just coasting on kits that they've been producing since the 1970s timeframe. And as one might imagine, kits that were designed with 1970 tooling was definitely going to start showing its age by the 1990s time frame. This was true for some of the kits from Italeri. However, those kits were more or less able to stay relevant for a long period of time, just with the way they were engineered. But with Tamiya, this was definitely something that was noteworthy. You see, the Tamiya models in comparison to the Italeri ones were designed to be motorized toys or more or less motorized models and because of this the kits had several concessions and design cues made to them to optimize them for the motorization operation. Well by the 1980s time frame the motorization was abandoned and the kits were just sold in a empty format and that was the way that they were produced for a number of years. Well as also one might imagine these kits here, because of these design choices made in the 70s, were really going to be substandard considering that the amount of technology that was around in the 1990s that were available to produce some high quality kits. And that is where this kit here came to be. This kit here, I want to say, was developed in the mid-1990s, around 1995 or 1996 or so, and was using technology, or I should say was using the lower hull molds from the revised Panther ALF G kits, which came out in the year or two that preceded this one. Unlike the older tooling kits from the 70s, this kit here was made with 100% new tooling and shared nothing in common with the legacy kit, outside of just the vehicle type. Also, to keep the old kits as relevant still for one reason or another, this one is not the exact same version as the older tooling kit from the 70s. The older tooling Yag Panther kit is considered to be the early version of the Yag Panther with some of the detail features found on it, while this one here is specifically made as the late version. This here is an interesting business choice for Tamiya to make because by making this one a different variant compared to the other one they do not have two kits of the exact same type and they could keep the two in production for a duration of time. The older kit even though it was as old and primitive as it was was still in production for many years even into the you know late portion of the 1990s because well just like with the Panther Alpha A they were still selling and the kits themselves were easy to make and were also much more affordable compared to this revised counterpart. Those older kits, like I stated in the OTR video, retailed anywhere from 15 to 20 US dollars, while this one here was much more expensive, being sold for anywhere between 35 to about 60 US dollars in 1990s money. So obviously these ones here were a considerable investment as opposed to the older tooling kits. 
However, at some point, the older kit sales must have slumped because to me themselves decided to pull the plug on those old kits and they have been terminated ever since. And it's really unlikely that they will ever come back into production, which is why the costs on those models that are still in the box right now have skyrocketed to the collector values that they have been. These kits here have still been in constant production, however, and because of that, they are ridiculously easy to find. You can find these anywhere from hobby shops to online retailers to swap meets model shows you name it these kits are very very prolific and because of that are fairly affordable because of the kits now older age which is funny to say because there was a time where this was the newest you know cutting edge kit these kits have kind of became fairly affordable where they retail anywhere between 25 to about 40 or 50 us dollars and they are still cheaper compared to several of the other super kits that have entered on the market recently from such companies as I believe Tacom or Mang or Dragon, for instance. They're always making a Yag Panther one flavor or another. These kits may be considered dated in some of the detail fittings compared to some of those other more modern kits. However, in my opinion, these models here still build into an excellent example of a Yag Panther, which hopefully I'll be able to execute once I crack the box open. So back to this particular model here. This one, I picked it up off of eBay. And like I mentioned before, I was given an offer I couldn't refuse, quite literally. This model here, I picked it up for about 20 US dollars. Why, you may ask? Well, the model is not exactly a virgin mint inbox kit. As you can see, it does have the ghetto wrapper on it, as this model was pre-owned and was pre-started by another builder. The individual who started the model pre-assembled it to a certain point, gave up on it for one reason or another, set it aside, and then decides to just hawk it off on eBay, to which I countered it. The price was still pretty good, so I decided, screw it, let me go ahead and nab it and, you know, see what I can do with it. And uh, we'll see exactly how that pans out once I crack it open. As I stated before, the model is wrapped in this ghetto shrink wrap that we have here, and I've yet to see the model in the flesh outside of the images that I saw on eBay when I picked it up almost about a year ago now. So uh, we're going to be rediscovering this together. So let me go ahead and cut off the ghetto shrink wrap over here just so we could take a better look at the box art and then the inner contents. With the shrink wrap removed, now you get to see the box art unencumbered with any sort of glare. And like true to me equality, the box art is excellent. The illustrations never disappoint, and here you get to see the illustration up close, just like with typical Tamiya fashion. It has some very nice detailing rendered on with the suspension, the wheels, the track, and if anyone's ever tried to draw a illustration of a tank before, you'll know exactly how tricky it is to get everything in proper proportion, specifically when you're doing a perspective type drawing. The kit number, by the way, is kit number 203, in case anyone needs to know that information. And here we have the remainder of the typography. Just like with many other Tamiya kits, the typography, or I should say the font used was the basically the Godfather font for one reason or another. Tamiya has been doing that for a long time. Of course, it quite clearly tells you it's the late version of the Yak Panther, which is true for some of the details that it has. And it you know, tells you some other pertinent information like the SDK of Z type, as well as reminding you that's part of the 135th scale military miniatures series. Of course, right there in the lower corner, we have the Tamiya logo, quite prominent. And that's it for the main box. On the side tab here, quite typical for Tamiya. End tab, we have a scaled down version of the same illustration, the remainder of the typography. We have a nice little German cross there for good measure. And we also have the MM number in the little bubbles. Corporate info. On the side tab here, we got some illustrations of the vehicle with different marking and camouflage options that can be rendered. And on the reverse side here, we have just some more nice little illustrations showing the different patterns that this model can be rendered. Of course, the copyright info right there is 1996. Like I said before, this was a mid-90s release. Okay, so now it's time to open up the kit to reveal the contents. And as I stated before, this one here is a partially started model. I don't think it qualifies as an OTR, but we'll see to muscle through regardless. 
Okay, so here we go with the instructions. I can set that aside just for the time being. Oh no, are those individual Lincoln Lane tracks? Well, no, they're not, fortunately. These here are the tracks that are going to be used for the spares that are located on the rear portion of the Panther hull. And Tamiya, by the way, did actually sell these as a aftermarket replacement set for the single piece vinyl tracks for the people out there without a brain stem that honestly think these tracks are any good, but you know, you know, they, they let them do their mistakes. Uh, these tracks here are decent for what they are. They do have some nice quality detailing on them where we have the correct shape of the track hinge. They do have the track tube detailing. However, the teeth are not hollow on the bottom portion for the mudslit, which is something that you would find on more contemporary uh, kit releases. However, the tracks are, you know, on par with the type of pieces that were out at the time from other makers like Italeri and uh, uh, Dragon. They were doing, you know, similar type of things. And this kit here would have fit right within that time period. Also, one thing I forgot to mention was that Italeri at the same time also released a Yag Panther, basically of the same type as this one here. And I actually done a video review of the Italeri Yag Panther. And yes, at the time there was this little rivalry on who had the better Panthers, be it Italeri or Tamiya. Both have their pros, both are better in some aspects, and both have deficiencies in other aspects. And at the end, you know, it will be interesting to see how the two stack up side by side. But Perhaps I'll do that in this video. We'll see if there's enough time for that. So with the spare tracks out of the way, this takes us to the remainder of the kit. I'm gonna start here with what the previous builder already accomplished. And he went ahead and secured the wheels to the hull at this time. And, I've, and this is definitely something that is going to be a problem for my build. I'm gonna to have to try to correct this. I don't know why, but a lot of people out there, they seem to want to build the suspension outright then try to paint around it. And this always blew my mind how people can do this technique specifically with a German tank with interloven wheels because good luck painting those rubber tires. Seriously, you, good luck with that. It's not happening. You're not going to be able to get paint into these fine recesses over here. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I know this because I've done this myself. When I used to build models, I used to basically do the same type of thing just without gluing the wheels on. And you're going to have bare areas of plastic exposed. So this is something that I'm definitely going to correct. So seriously, guys, if you're building a tank model, don't glue the wheels on before the thing is painted. It's just, you're, you're not going to get them painted. It's, it's, it's physically impossible. So this is something I am going to rectify. So the sprocket and the idlers are not glued on. That's good. Neither are the inner wheels, but the outer wheels he glued on, but oh, looks like I can pop the glue seams. This is fantastic. Oh, this is great. This has just made my life a hell of a lot easier. So I can go ahead and pluck these things off, which will make the wheel painting all that much more easier. So this was actually one of the big bugaboos on this build. I had my fingers crossed on it. I was worried that I was going to break one of the torsion bars. So I was going to have to make a mold of one of the spare ones and then replace them with resin castings. But uh, so far, it doesn't look like to be the case. So that is excellent. So there we have that going on. Also, it looks like the previous builder went ahead and pre-glued the rear deck, or I should say the rear plate here to the the, the model's hull. The hull on this one was a single piece molding with the exception of the rear portion. And also one huge improvement from this kit compared to the legacy releases is that at this time to me I realized, oh yeah, sponsons are a thing and the tooling have the sponsons integrally molded on. Excellent, excellent. It, like, it took you long enough to me to figure that out. Now, if they can only do that on some of their other kits, you know, that remains to be seen. But yeah, that was definitely one positive attribute that these kits had from the 1990s time frame. So going on further takes us to the upper hull. And the upper hull looks pretty good. One thing that's nice about the Tamiya is that they went ahead and rendered in the duct work here for the Panther. And if anyone has seen my 1-6 scale King Tiger video, you'll know that the Tiger, the King Tiger and the Panther have a similar type design here on the back. And these are ducts that have flaps on them to constrict the airflow for cold weather starting. And the Tamiya kit actually has the flap general detailing integrally molded in. So that's a nice touch. The engine hatch is 
not integrally molded on and something that you can model either in the open or closed state. Of course, I can briefly touch upon the Italery kit where this whole area here was not only functional but can be removed. So you have the engine interior underneath that can be modeled. And again, that's something I discuss in more depth in those videos. The remainder of the detail, again, it's nice and crisply molded, which is quite typical for Tamiya. You know, Tamiya always had some very nice, clean, crisp moldings and it's part of the, you know, the Tamiya experience, I should say. The well beads are present on the panel lines. They're not overly rendered, but you know, they definitely do the job, I find. Specifically, if you use just the right amount of paint, if it's properly diluted, yeah, the well beads will come out perfectly fine. We have this little runner section here that's obviously going to be deleted and cut away. And this may uh, be a little tricky to remove for some novice builders out there if you don't have the right tooling for that. But, you know, we'll see how that pans out as the video goes on. The Tamiya Yag Panther also had some interior detailing on the fighting compartment sections, which is why we have these grooves molded in for some of the interior bulkheads, which are supplied with a kit that you'll see once I go into the runners. Or at least hopefully they're there. I'm assuming they're there. So let's uh, see how that pans out. And uh, okay, this is interesting. It looks like I have an extra set of runners here from another Panther. Okay, so these two runners here, uh, yeah, this plot definitely just got thicker. We can see these two runners over here have been depleted to put the suspension on the vehicle. However, there is a third runner right over here that still has everything intact, and it's the same runner. I don't know if this is something from another kit that the guy had in his stash and it wound up in this one, but I, I actually built one of these to me, a Yak Panthers, by the way, about 20 some odd years ago. In fact, that's gonna be a topic of an OTR video that I have in, in the works. It's part of the reason why I'm building this one. Um, but I don't recall there being a whole extra runner like this uh, for these parts. To me, it's usually pretty good with that. Dragon, on the other hand, pff, they'll give you a whole nother hull. They don't care. Uh, they, they love getting these spare parts. But this is, um, yeah, this is, I, th I think this is a mistake. I think this is from someone else, I, from another Panther. So, uh, if you bought a, a Panther kit from that guy, uh, I got your runner right here for the wheels. But anyway, back to the runner, at least you can see what it looks like brand new. The molding on the wheels is excellent. You know, to me it has some excellent, excellent moldings like I touched upon before. The sprockets have their interior and exterior fasteners present. They have their locking plates all there. The hubcaps are really nicely done with the Zerk fitting found on the outer section. I, and I also like the fact that you can tell that the hubcap is is separate from the wheel hub or the wheel itself, which you can see from that seam that's integrally molded in this round section over here, which again looks very realistic. Specifically, if you throw some accent in there, it really makes the piece pop quite a bit. The eilers are also nicely done. And here you have to see the swing arms. Swing arms are also excellently rendered. They have the right geometry to them, the right detailing on them. They have the center torsion bar fastener detailing molded in. Nicely done. We've got some periscopes, we've got some fender mounts, and also we have the spare track racks. Pretty good for what they are and what they're going to be used for. Here we have the exhaust manifold. This runner, by the way, is borrowed and is used on several other of the Tamiya Panther Alf G kits. I'm not sure if the, the new recent Panther D kit utilizes this runner or not, but all the kits from the 90s definitely rinse, wash, and repeat with this sprue. Oh, and the color, again, it's typical Tamiya with this Dunkelgelb type coloring. It's just, you know, a Tamiya kit when you see it. So with that runner and these two depleted runners out of the way... Oh, we have a little bit of copper wire over here. This is to be used as the track removal cable detailing that's found on the side of the vehicle. We'll see whether or whether or not I use it on this build. Should be interesting to see how that pans out. And we also have a set of decals and some loose Panther G lay pattern exhaust manifolds right over here. We'll touch upon that as the video goes on. So this runner here is obviously specifically for the Yag Panther. It's the mantlet. And one thing I always liked about this kit was the quality of cast texturing present on the tooling. If the piece, or I should say if the lens 
uh, focuses enough, you should be able to see the cast texturing in better light. And I also like the geometry on this piece here. To me, it really nailed it with this kit. The well itself is also n equally as nicely rendered as the mantlet. Here we have the grill work. Note it does have the breather detailing right there on the back. And it does also have the cut lines found on the, ex on the grill work itself. Although they did like what Armor Tech does, and they didn't go ahead and mold it all the way through. They did the thing where they mold it part way through and they have a little bridge on the inside over there. More than likely this is done for rigidity and it's more than likely done for ease of molding more than anything else. But some of the other kits out there, namely the Dragon ones, actually had that thoroughly molded out. So that's one thing to factor in, you know, if you're working on one of these older kits. I also like, by the way, the, the depth of these pieces here, they are nice and thick, which again is something that is true to form on the real vehicle. The next runner here contains the interior and the remainder of the detail components for the Yag Panther. So we have the inner portion of the breech, we have the main tube, which is a two part assembly. Quite standard on these kits from all different makes and even up until today you still see the majority of new release tank kits in the same type of format. So there is going to be some seam work to contend with but again nothing that's too egregious or out of the ordinary. We have some other detail components for the main armament. We got some hatches, we got a figure here which I'm not going to use as I never do. And we also have some other patterns of the exhaust manifold, which is interesting to point out. So you do have some options with the exhaust manifold found on this kit. You could do it with the tube type, or you can do it with the earlier pattern. You know, this does lead a lot of variation for this particular kit. So you can buy two of them and have no two look alike. Great, So, which means I'm gonna have to find another one of these and add it to the collection. But anyway, uh, here go those bulkheads I was talking about before. The kit does not have any other interior type details like the ammo racks or radio or anything like that. It just gives you these basic details that we have here. To a Panther Alpha G runner, which were specifically one with the chin armor. We have some grill covers, which is kind of interesting. They molded them in plastic and they do have some nice depth to them. We have some hatches, rear bins, the side skirts, tow cables, the stave tube, as well as the late G pattern of cold weather air intake. Got the Bosch light, travel lock. Like obviously 90% of these components are not gonna be used on this build, you know, the G specific parts, but a good number of the other parts are going to be used on this model. And taking this down further, we got some loose odds and ends running around. We got a nice little color chart over here. That's a nice little touch. And this takes us to the tracks. And ah, uh, one thing I loved about older Tamiya kits, which is something that they seem to have forgotten about in, in recent releases, is single piece vinyl tracks. These tracks are awesome. And no, they are not gonna be replaced. There's no need to replace them. The tracks found on this generation of Tamiya kits here from the 1990s was actually excellent. The vinyl was a nice durable material and not only was the material nice and flexible, wasn't too stiff or anything, so you get to contort it around different types of contours, but the detailing on the surface was excellent in its quality. If the camera can zoom in here, you get to see the quality found on the surface of the track. All the grouser and ice cleat details are present. And on the inside portion over here, you see all of the interior hinge work, like with those little wavy bends found on the hinge that I touched upon before with the spares. The side portions of the track do have their, their rigidity details molded in. However, the mud slits are absent. There are a few casting nubs or molding nubs right here in a few staggered section on the middle portion of the track. They're, they should be easily cleaned up and because they're in the center portion over here are not gonna be seen specifically with the way the interloven suspension is arranged. But again, I always did love these tracks and I actually used them on a Dragon Flak Panzer Colian that I built a number of years ago. And I definitely recommend. If you can find these tracks as loose, 
definitely pick them up and you know salvage a dragon tank with them because they're awesome. The next thing to mention is the set of water slide decals. The kit gives you enough decals to render the model in one of three configurations, which is a very nice touch. The decal quality is quite typical for Tamiya with the blue paper backing and Honestly, I've had some excellent results with Tamiya markings in the past. Tamiya decals have always been really, really good, and this has been on even on some Tamiya kits that I've built from the 1980s time frame, or even the 1970s time frame for that matter. Uh, this model here being a secondhand release, I can see the decals have some damage on them. There's some cracks happening over here. More likely they were bent at some period of time. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they work, but, you know, we'll see how that pans out once the model progresses. I'm not predicting the decals to give me any sort of problems, but, you know, hey, anything can happen. More likely they're going to crack on me in the areas where I can see the cracks on the surface, but we'll see if that's going to be a problem when it comes time for aligning them onto the side of the model. One other thing about, to me, decals from the 90s time frame was they gave you this cool little silhouette here of the tank in question, and this is a decal, and uh, one thing that you can do with these, and I used to do this a lot when I was a kid, is you can actually cut this out and use them as kill markings on other models. So that is something to keep in mind in case anyone has the idea to do that. So on the bottom portion of the back here, we have the late pattern of Panther G-type exhaust manifolds with their separate brackets that you can see here. One of them is apparently pretty wrecked quite badly. I'm not sure if it's gonna be salvaged. Uh, I'm not sure if I need it at all, but you know, we'll see how that pans out. Here goes the exhaust manifold here fully assembled. So it has the nice little intake detailing right here on the top. It's got the tube section and we have a nice rendered bottom area with welds and all. One thing I do notice is that the bottom portion here is a bit weak on the Tamiya model, uh, you know, specifically if you compare this to the Dragon or even the Italeri, I think they had a better rendered out bottom portion. This does make the unit easier to assemble because it's not a two-piece assembly like it is on those other kits and you actually have a seam work to contend with right here. But this is something that does admittedly hurt the look of the piece, specifically if you're rolling with this unit. Fortunately, it's on the bottom, it's not really that visible, but it is something I did want to mention. The top portion here does have the, the fan work that I mentioned before, and it does look nicely rendered, but there was another option where you can model it with this cool duct that we have right here, which goes right here on this portion, but unfortunately, it's an either or type thing, so if you assemble it in this format, you don't put the little duct on, and if you want the duct, you don't have the grill section. So, you know, it's that type of a setup. The elbow itself, which kind of looks like macaroni from this angle, uh, is a two-piece assembly, so you will have, of course, a seam to contend with. The real question is whether or whether or not I'm gonna use this set here, because with this one kid, you can render it in three different configurations. So, oh no, I'm probably gonna have to buy two more of these kits, aren't I? Lovely. Anyway, let's continue with the remainder of the video. One very last thing I need to mention is with the instructions themselves. These are definitely 1990s era of Tamiya instruction sheets, complete with just the, the general graphic design. For anyone that's built Tamiya kits, you'll know what I'm talking about. On the inside portion here, we have all of the CAD drawings or illustrations laid out, and they're Tamiya, which means they are excellently rendered, clear and concise, and to me instructions have always been good. Even the ones from the 70s were quite good. The ones from the 90s were excellent. Obviously, everything you need to know is found in the instructions over here, and of course, if there's any sort of issue or hiccup or any sort of mishap, I will gladly point that out as the video progresses. So here's the model going through its production paces. Just like true to form to any Tamiya, this thing goes together in practically no time. The one thing I did want to mention was with one of the swing arms. As I touched upon before, the wheels were glued on on this model prematurely. And I went ahead and was able to remove most of the row wheels with the exception of one. Well, during extraction, the whole swing arm just buckled and broke. But again, fortunately, as I touched upon before, I have an extra set on this example over here. So I was able to drill out the material that was present. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I was able to drill out the remnants of the torsion bar on both the inner portion here of the hull as well as the inner portion of the wheel. With those sections removed, basically the kit was 
backdated back to its original form. So the addition of the new part here went on without any problems and just went on as it would have originally. The trick when you're doing this is you want to use a Dremel with a router bit. The router bit that I use are purchased from the vendor listed in the video description below and the same router bit was used on the wheel itself. This is something that you do want to take some care with because you have to eat just the right amount of material on this portion over here so that just the remembrance of the stem are removed but the original hole itself is still left intact. With the way these things are glued on, once a, a certain number of materials removed, the remaining sections just buckle out of the way and it leaves for the original part to be more or less left intact. Same thing is also true on the row wheel. The row wheel you also have to pay attention to because you don't want to widen the hole, so you have to be really, really careful with that. In addition to the um, the router bit, I, could, I also used a small round needle file in order just to polish it up a little bit further but at the end of the day the procedure was a complete success and as you can see or as we saw before even I was barely able to remember which one of the torsion bars I actually did the job on but once everything is done properly it should leave for a seamless appearance I will say though that I did make one small mistake and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this is something that can happen to just about anyone who's just going through the paces and didn't pay attention to the instructions as much as they should have. And that is with the air intake that's right here on the rear portion of the engine deck. All Panthers have this breather section right here on this portion. And the locations are present on the kit. However, they require you, the builder, to drill out the indications with a pin vise. They are integrally molded on. However, as you can see, I forgot to do that when I was assembling the upper hull. So this is something that I'm going to have to basically piece together. I'm going to have to figure out where the holes were and then drill them out accordingly. If you're working on one of these Tamiya Yag Panthers, keep this in mind. Pay attention to this area here. In fact, this should be the first thing you do outside of getting rid of that lug that's in one of these sections over here that's a bit of runner. That needs to be amputated. But regardless, this should be the number one thing you take care of is to drill out those two sections over there. Otherwise, it's going to add a bit of complication to the model. Nothing too elaborate, but you know, it, it is something that is going to be a bit of a task to try to make sure that the unit lines up appropriately and it's in the correct location. So that is something I'm going to be addressing momentarily. Starting with the model suspension, now that the model is fully complete, you really get to see how the suspension panned out. And as we touched upon earlier, this model was interesting because this particular kit was pre-started by another individual and he went ahead and tried to pre-assemble all of the running gear prior to the model being painted. And as I always mention, on any tank this is definitely a bad idea, but on an interloven wheel German tank, you got to be smoking something because it's just a terrible idea and you're going to have missed paint areas. I already went into great length on the revision work required to repair some of the swing arms and now that the model is fully complete you can see that it definitely repaired absolutely perfectly and if I didn't mention it at all I'd be hard pressed to find out if anyone would have been able to tell that this model here had some repair work done to the swing arms. As for the quality of moldings found on the details like I mentioned before the wheels on the Tamiya Panther kits are actually some of my favorite and they weather very, very nicely. The use of Tamiya panel line accent is definitely going to be your best friend on this type of a component. And as you can see, once the panel line accent goes into those locations, it really makes all of those little fasteners just shine and it really does improve the build overall. The other thing I want to mention, and this is a common technique that I add to my builds are the ball bearings with their sweaty type weathering effects. This is something that would not be uncommon on real German tanks in the field or just about any military vehicle or commercial vehicle for that matter. These things tend to wear out and when they do the oil tends to seep out in the following format. Of course it's something that as a builder you do have several artistic licensing and techniques with 
and you can replicate it in a multitude of different ways where you can have the piece just slightly sweaty to where you have some grime on it to where you even have some starfish effects. All of these are just basically up to the choice of the builder at hand. Also, as I mentioned, you don't want to have the same type of weathering on every single wheel as this is something that can actually be a detrimental effect as opposed to helping your build out. So you want to use this as like you would spices on a, you know, on one of, on a meal you're cooking and you want to utilize it sparingly. Just sprinkle it on a few row wheels here or there and this will be something to give your build a little bit of extra character and some nice detailing. Another bit of detailing that I always mention on my videos is the painting of the Zerk fittings and by the the way, in case anyone wondering, it's spelled Z-E-R-K. A lot of people out there hear me say this and they have no clue what I'm talking about or how to spell it. And there you go, there's the proper spelling, Z-E-R-K. Zerk fittings are grease nipples that are found on many components found on military vehicles and even commercial vehicles. And this is where you would hook up a grease gun or an oiler of some sort in order to inject some lubrication into certain locations. Well, on these military vehicles, they are painted in red, and a lot of times they are molded into these models, be it on a Sherman, a Patton, or in this case, a Panther, or Yak Panther. And on the models here, it's always best to paint them in red because the detailing is there, and once the little paint is added, it really makes the build pop and give it so much extra detailing with minimum amount of work. On a Yak Panther, and this is true for a few other German World War II tanks, the Zerk fitting is found right here on the center portion here of all of the hubcaps and on these models here I also went ahead and painted them in red. Hopefully it comes out in camera but again it's just one of those little details that when you add it to the build it definitely improves it tenfold. Of course carry on brings us to the track and as I mentioned before I absolutely love <laughs> love the Tamiya single piece vinyl tracks from this era. In my opinion the Tamiya tracks from the 90s were some of the best quality of rubber tracks that have been made by that company and that's saying a lot because their tracks were always generally pretty good throughout the years. Sadly they're moving away from this media and going towards the horrid individual Lincoln Link tracks which is I will still die on this hill is a humongous mistake it is a terrible idea and are way inferior compared to the tracks that are found on this older generation kit. Seriously Tamiya you lost your way. You need to go back into your roots. Give us tracks that don't suck. I really don't want to spend an extra 20 or 50 bucks buying tracks just so I could build one of your models properly. And before anyone chimes in about use this brand of snake oil glue or this type of technique, I don't care. I've seen it. I've judged shows before. I've seen people use those glues and techniques. And guess what? The tracks still suck in the end. Don't care what anyone says. That's just, again, that's the hill I'm dying on. And uh, I will stand by that. So uh, here you can see what the tracks look like fitted to the model. These tracks here, of course, are not painted with flat can rattle can spray paint. This is because, again, like I often mention in these videos, the rubber material of these tracks can potentially have a negative reaction with those paints. And if that happens, the tracks can dry rot or just melt on you depending on the paint that you use. In order to play it safe on all of my single piece vinyl tracks be from Tamiya, Dragon DS Styrene, and specifically Dragon DS Styrene, you don't want to use rattle cans on that, and even tracks from Metallery or Academy, you want to go ahead and paint them with a acrylic type paint. And for this, I utilize Tamiya Flat Black. The one on the bottle, not the spray paint, that's enamel. And I've actually had a discussion with a certain individual in one of my comment section about that. The paint is enamel. I've used it in the past. I can tell you for a fact, it's enamel. So for these models though, I utilize the uh, the bottle of XF1, flat black. It's applied to the track bands via the airbrush. And then from there, it gets the dry brushing coat that you see here. The dry brushing silver paint is actually enamel, but it's not making contact with the rubber because of the thorough coat of Tamiya flat black that's applied underneath, not to mention a few of the other weathering washes that it gets prior to the dry brushing. As for the tracks themselves, they go together very, very well. It's almost seamless once they connect. And then you have to do the little trick where you glue the top portions of the track to the wheels in order to achieve the illusion of the track sag like you see on this model. Once everything is said and done, it always leaves for some fantastic results. And again, I absolutely love the tracks found on these Tamiya kits from this era. Moving from the suspension takes to the rear plate detailing, all the components you see here are stock with the Timia build, and for this particular example, I went with the earlier pattern of exhaust manifolds. 
because with the way the kit is designed, you do have two options to render this model. For this one here, I went with the earlier pattern. However, the later patterns are not sitting in the spare parts because they were actually utilized on an OTR lay pattern to me at Yag Panther Rebuild that I've posted a video on, and that video can be also found on the ECA channel. Both of the detail components are absolutely excellent, and it just depends on just what type of build you're looking for. The instructions are very well laid out. If you follow the instructions, you'll be utilized the correct components for your build, and the build will go by in a very smooth and relatively effortless manner. From the exhaust manifolds brings us to the rear reflector as well as the rear convoy light. The rear reflector light is right here. It's integrally molded into this model and it's also integrally molded in on just about every other kit that's on the market with the exception of some other ones where it's an actual separate piece, which is a nice bit of tooling by the way. But for this one here, it's just a small little piece that's molded in. The only thing the builder needs to pay attention to is with a small drop of gloss red paint added right over there and this gives you the look of the reflector lens which would be present on this pattern of vehicle. As for the convoy light, on this one here I painted in green. In the past I used to paint them in blue. However, I have been told and I've seen some reference material on the subject that say that they were actually green in color. So for this one here, I went with the green. The green itself was testers just uh, enamel green. It does a good effect on replicating the piece to look like that that green amber color that you generally see on these type of vehicles on their on their rear convoy lights. So just a quick little swipe of green paint and that leads the results that you see here. Moving to the front takes to the front detailing. Nothing really much going on here. Basically everything you see here is stock with Tamiya. On the main armament itself, it is fully functional in that you can pivot it left and right and you can also move it up and down. This is all as per the kit. One tip I recommend is that on the turning points on the inside, you can add a small little drop of white glue just to keep everything nice and stiff as generally these type of pivot points here tend to loosen up over time and then the thing's gonna look like it's gonna need Viagra. So uh, if you wanna prevent that, just add a small little drop of white glue during the building process and you should be good to go. With the model temporarily placed on its side, this leads us to the under sponsoring area here, right here on the front. This is a bit of detailing that I've added on several other of my Panther and Yag Panther builds. However, I always negate to mention it in the video. However, on the Panther, the power conduit that's for the headlight is mounted in a certain format. Rather than sticking out of the side and entering into the front like it does on something like a Panzer IV, on the Panther and Yak Panther family, it actually emerges from the bottom portion of the headlight housing, runs along the spots and enters into the vehicle right over there in that corner. This is a bit of detailing that's emitted from the stock Timia kit and was added with just a small piece of floor wire. No more, no less. You cut a length to, to shape and simply glue it in the appropriate location and you're good to go. Also in this area over here, I also painted the little small tire that's found right there behind the main sprocket. This, of course, is a nice little bit of detailing that's found with the kit, but it's also one that a lot of people forget to paint out there on their builds. On this piece over here, it's actually rubber rim, just like the standard rubber tires. The Germans love their complexity, of course, and for this one here, I simply painted in the exact same format. This little bit of detailing is also a bit of detailing that I generally add at the tail end of the build just before I install the main road wheels, as well as the sprockets, for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Moving up takes the main 88, and this of course is the kit component and was utilized out of box. The only thing to mention is that when you're assembling this model here, this section is a two-piece assembly, of course, which is customary on many models on the market, and this one here utilizes the exact same procedures in order to polish it down. The only thing that was utilized was some thick super glue, some sandpaper, as well as some needle files in order to bring the outer appearance to the way you see it here. Yes, there are aftermarket units on, out there that are for this particular kit. Is this something that's worth it? Eh, this is best left up to discretion of the builder. However, in my opinion, the stock unit polishes up very, very well and nicely. The only thing I want to mention is that on the front section over here where we have this little inlet as well as this other little cut, this is something that generally gets plugged up with the bodywork during the bodywork procedure and the builder needs to go in here and recarve them out. This is once this procedure is done, it looks really, really good and it returns the 88 to its appropriate look. In order to help carve these out, I utilize the lathe, a needle file, and even X-Acto knife for this one over here because the slice is so thin. And once everything is concluded, it really does look very well. I believe in the OTR video for the other Tamiya Yag Panther that I recently completed, I actually show the sanding procedure in better light. 
Same is true for not just the main barrel section, but also for the brake itself. Of course, the brake is integrally molded into the barrel sections, and it gets done with the bodywork in one fell swoop. Once all the bodywork is concluded, everything leaves for a nice seamless result, and like I mentioned before, the kit component is more than capable for the task at hand. Moving to the sides of the model takes us to the Pioneer details as well as the tin work details. And starting with the fender mounts, the fender mounts are all supplied with the model and they are decently rendered. The one modification that I made was with a pin vise, I drilled out the hole that's present on the sections here. The hole is integrally molded on, however, it's just a small little dimple and it doesn't go all the way through. To improve the accuracy of the build, I went ahead and drilled them out and hopefully it comes out on camera. This was done to every one of these units on both sides. These little clips here need to be added very carefully because these are the type of things that can easily be lost or snagged. And once the piece goes to lost party, you're pretty much going to be screwed because the kit only gives you enough for to equip one model. And I don't recall if there are any spares on hand. Having said that, once the components are fitted in place, they do the detailing job very, very nicely. And again, they are very nicely rendered. Obviously, this was done to the components on both sides of this model. As for the tools themselves, again, these are the kit original ones and go on without any sort of problems or other complications. The kit is very nicely designed in this regard and everything just lines up where it needs to. Moving rearward takes to the spare tracks. These are the kit supply ones and we're utilizing the kit supply individual Lincoln lengths for these six units that we have here. The Lincoln lengths work great for things like spare tracks. However, for main track bands, eh, not so much. The components assemble and then are secured to the kit supply track racks like you see in the following format. For this model here, I always tend to build my Panthers with the tracks fully fleshed out on the racks with the exception of one or two of them for reasons that I mentioned in those videos. But it's just, I don't know, I just can't help myself. I start installing the track links, they look cool, and then, you know, by the end of the day, my tank has all of the tracks fitted in place. However, one common modeling trick you can do to add a little bit more variation to your build is to leave either the track racks empty by one or two links, or instead of having the duels like I have here, you only have one link in a certain location. But again, this is best left up to the discretion of the builder, and it's something if you want to add a little bit more character to your build, as opposed to having them fully fleshed out like I've done here. On this side here, you can see the remainder of the tool detailing, and also the stave storage tube. The stave storage tube, of course, is a two-piece assembly, just like the main 88, and it's handle in the same format with the same type of results with the use of sandpaper and thick super glue. After the polishing is done, I like to prime the tube to make sure there aren't any surprises of any seam works being remained. Once the paint sets and everything looks good, it gets fitted to the model and then the unit, can, or I should say the model, can compress further with the remainder of its build. Same thing is also true for the main tube, by the way. Both of these I like to pre-paint prior to the installation, again, to make sure there's no hidden surprises. Moving upward takes to the rear engine deck, and this is where the model has some aftermarket components fitted. First, I just want to say the stock components are excellent. They go into their appropriate locations without any sort of problems. On this model over here, I actually did run into a small little hiccup with the rear intake where the kit has some areas that need to be drilled out with a pin vise. They are properly labeled on the kit. However, when I was going through the build, I forgot to drill them out as you know everything was happening really fast. And this was something that needs to have been addressed after the fact, after the model was fully assembled. I actually have a tutorial video that I recently posted about this particular build and I show exactly what happens if you encounter this. And it's a nice emergency procedure in case you accidentally forget to drill something out on your plastic model, be it on the Tamiya Yak Panther or some other model kit that comes to mind. The link for that video is also found on the video description listed below. As for the piece, once the units are drilled out, they get mounted into their appropriate locations and they look excellent. Now, one thing I want to mention is that some of the interesting design choices on the rear engine deck leads me to guesstimate that I believe Tamiya was going to produce two variants of the Ag Panther, the early production and the late production. However, for one reason or another, they never went ahead and actually produced the early one. And the late one is the only one that they've ever released at this point, or at least this point where I'm filming this video. I say that because the way the engine grills are designed, you can see that they had a a switchable set where you, they had the intentions of possibly making an early one, but it just never happened. Regardless, the pieces are excellent. They drop into their right locations and the kit looks very nice. 
However, on this one here, you'll see that I also added some extra photo etch. The photo etch is actually from Edward. It's an older set, but it's one of my personal favorite Panther photo etch sets out there. I've utilized it on a number of builds that I've been seeing on this channel for two reasons. First, these sets are very affordable. They're also pretty available for the longest period of time. And on top of that, they are simple. They only give you the components for the grill work. This is important to point out because there's a ton of other photo etch sets that are out there that are way more expansive and expensive, and they give you other sorts of bits of equipment that I personally don't really need or I deem is necessary for my builds, and the last thing I need to do is pay more money for components that I'm just not gonna utilize. The Edwards ones here give you the fan grill covers, the the intake covers, and they also have the shutters like you see here. And yes, on this one, I also went ahead and Equip them all fully shuttered up because, you know, I'm like a dog chasing a car, basically. Uh, I, again, I feel bad when I, I'm installing them and I have these really cool shutters and I, uh, you know, I leave two on and the other two are just sitting in my spare bin and I just feel bad. So I tend to equip all four. Uh, I just want to say uh, this is probably the last model I'm going to do in this format. Uh, if next time I do a Panther, I'm going to try to you know, uh, push my brakes a little bit and, uh, you know, only have it with the actual mesh work as opposed with the shutters. But on this one here, the shutters are there. And to be fair, the shutters look actually pretty cool and they're good quality found on the Edward set. They're simple, but they're effective in my opinion. Other bit of detailing I want to mention are these little hooks. These hooks here are absent on the Tamiya model. However, the ones that you see here are made from HD 3D printed components and are something that I developed while I was working on the other OTR Yag Panther. These components are found on the ECA Shapeway Store where it's a set where it supplies you with a bunch of components to fix or I should say upgrade either a Tamiya Yag Panther or a Panther of one flavor or another. The set contains the lift hooks, some antenna bases, and also the track racks. Although in this model over here, the antenna base and the track racks are the kit original ones. On the other OTR Yag Panther build that I mentioned before, that one actually features the HD 3D printed parts that I just mentioned. As for the hooks, these are appropriately scaled. They have the right geometry to them, and they also have the weld bead detailing integrally printed on. This is something that in the past you would have to get from Photo Etch, and in my opinion, the Photo Etch sets are a bit lacking in that I think they're a little too thin for the scale, and also you are missing the weld beads. On top of that, trying to glue them in place was always something that was a bit of a pain in the ass, just because of how thin everything is, and you're working with glue and tweezers, and they just love to make a mess of things very quickly. So for this one here, you see the HD 3D, the HD 3D printed units utilized. The set contains a ton of these components, so there's more than enough to outfit more than one vehicle, or if you tend to be accident prone and break one or two, you do have some extras on the set waiting for you to uh, replace and repair on your model. Same is true for not just the hooks, but the racks, and yes, even the antenna base as well. As for the detailing back here, quite standard for one of my builds on the Panther and Yag Panther and the King Tiger for that matter, these are your filler caps. This one here is for the radiator fluid and this one here is for the fuel. And if anyone's ever worked with heavy machinery, you'll know that filling up a fuel spout on one of them is a messy affair and it's not uncommon to get a leak or two. And here you can see the soot effects and the sweaty effects from that type of a procedure. On the rear engine hatch over here, Yag Panthers have these two bump stops and they are notable to point out. On some of them I've seen little rubber bump stops found in these areas over here, however on the Tamiya kit they are missing and it just has the little mounting studs. The rear hatch is fully functional on the Tamiya kit out of the box, as you can see. I did not weather or paint the inside of the hatch, what you see is just the Tamiya accent color, but if you do want to paint and add some interior color around here. The tank does have, or should say the vehicle does have some basic interior detailing, but it's nothing really much to mention for the purpose of this build here. You know, it's just, I just made the hatch function because why not, but I didn't go ahead and actually paint the interior because it wasn't necessary in my opinion. But again, if you are working on one of these models and you know, you want to paint up the insides, this kit here will give you the option to do that. Moving upward takes to the top deck detailing and everything you see here is stock Tamiya, mostly assembled out of the box. First, I just want to mention on the antenna base, I went ahead and drilled it out so I could insert a metal 
piece of wire to give it for the antenna detailing. As I always mention on these German World War II tanks, the antenna base itself would, maybe, would be made out of rubber. The middle section here is brass, and then the remainder of the antenna rod itself would be painted in black. This is the way I always represent it on my models, and it's a simple thing to add on your build, and it's something that always helps the accuracy overall. Next thing I want to mention are the periscopes. German World War II periscopes were made out of a Bakelite housing, and they were either a red Bakelite or a black Bakelite in question. So when you're building your model, you want to consider that. If you are painting it black, just paint the whole thing gloss black and you should be good to go. For this build though, I like to use red Bakelite just because it gives it a little bit extra added color pop and also allows me to paint the lens a different color, which again gives the model just a little bit more of extra detail flair. On the front section here, we have the two periscopes. The one on this kit here is actually optional. You could have it in the exposed or the retracted state. For this one here, obviously I went with the open state because you know, why not? It gives you nice extra detailing. And on this one here, on the little flap that opens up, I went ahead and painted the inside portion primer red, just because this is something that adds a little bit more extra color to the model, and it wouldn't be uncommon to see on real vehicles. The other periscope is right over here, and this one is, again, the kit original. However, I went ahead and modified the kit from the original format. The kit does have its lens right here, but it's just molded flat. In order to improve the model with a pin vise, I carefully, cannot stress that enough, drilled out the center portion over here, adding a nice little well. With that center portion added, it allowed me to paint the lens detailing, giving the model just that much extra added detailing. The last thing I want to mention about this model, and this is true for all Yag Panthers, you have to pay attention to the orientation of the hatches. With the way the hatches are designed, you can accidentally insert them inverted. And if that's the case, you're going to be left to try to pop them off and repair them. This is something I ran into on the Italeri. uh Yag Panther builds that I mentioned before. However, for this one here, the kit is very nicely illustrated in the instructions, just pay attention, close attention to the instructions, and you shouldn't have any problems with the hatch orientation. But again, it is something I do want to mention, as this can potentially lead to issues for some builders out there. And that's all there is to it for the details. This leads us to the paint and the markings. For the camouflage work, this is all done via the airbrush, and I utilize the three-tone German camouflage scheme that you see here. For the colors, they're my usual colors that I use on my builds. For the Dunkelgelb, this is exterior latex, and the brown and the green are both Tamiya. Tamiya acrylic specifically. The green is Tamiya olive green, and the brown is dark brown. Once everything is applied with the airbrush, it then goes and gets its weathering, which is the use of washes and counter shading, leaving for the results that we have here. The other weathering is done via the dry brush, and then once everything is done, it also gets its Tamiya paneline accents, leaving for the end result that you see presently on this model. For the model's markings, I went with the Tamiya water slide decals, and as I touched upon before, they are excellent in quality. I always had some excellent results with Tamiya decals. This model here is definitely no exception. The decals are perfect. They went out without any sort of problems, secured to the model, and then once the model was coated with DMS matte varnish, it leaves for the end result that you see presently. As I mentioned several times in this video, this is not the first time I've actually built one of the 1990s vintage late production Tamiya German Yak Panther models. I built one of these kits many, many years ago, and that model was the subject matter of an OTR rebuild video, which by the way, that video can be found in the video description listed below. As I mentioned in this, or I should say in that video, this model here, I was able to fully restore because of this model here being in my stash. Several of the components on this model were either missing, destroyed, or just didn't hold up to the paint stripping process, and because of that, replacements were going to be necessary. And this kit over here acted as the donor in order to supply the needed components in order to get this one fully restored. Many of the detail components that I still needed for this one were copied by, I took the components, made molds out of them, and then casted resin replacements. The cast resin components were then just fitted to this model here, fleshing it out to the following format. The resin components would include the grill work, as well as also the tin work mounts. However, one thing that was really advantageous about this particular 
example here, and it really just, you know, was a happy accident, was the fact that this kit supplied me with extra runners that would normally not be found on the model. Why this was super important was that because of these extra components, I was able to take some of these pieces, which would have been spares normally, and use them to flesh out this example. These would include things like a new sprocket, as well as several of the swing arms. Without that runner on hand, I was going to need to make new molds for these components and cast the replacements in resin, but fortunately that just wasn't the case because I had legit OG Tamiya ones on hand, ready to go. So, as, well, as I always mention in these videos, whenever I have a uh, an accompanying build, it's good to see the two on the table at the same time. And it's also great to have both of these examples built differently from one another, just so it adds a little bit of different variation to the collection. This one here is built without the tin work, and also with the early pattern of exhaust manifolds, while this one over here, the tin work was present, and I went with the later production type exhaust. That's one advantage about the Tamiya Yag Panther kit. You can actually build this vehicle in one of three different configurations. And in addition to that, the kit does supply you with three types of decals. So with one kit here, I was not only able to get the components to build this one, but also to get it fully marked up with legit original Tamiya markings. All in all, it was a really great buddy to have in the stash. And while we're on the topic of cameos, like I mentioned before earlier in the video, during the 1990s time frame, you had a bit of an arms race on who can make the better Yag Panther and Panther family of kits. Obviously, this one here is the Tamiya Contender, but fortunately in my collection, I have the other Contender that was available at the same time. And that one was from none other than Italeri. Here you get to see the Italeri Contender side by side the Tamiya counterpart. This model here is the subject matter of its own model showcase video and that of course can be found on the ECA channel and it can also be found in the link listed below in the video description. And as you can see by side by side they look really really good and welcome to the pain it was back in the 90s where you wanted a Yag Panther and you had basically two excellent choices to pick from. Now of course both of them have their strong suits and and weaknesses and as for which one was better well at the end of the day in my opinion it was basically a wash both of them had things that the other one didn't and you know it was just basically depending on what you were looking for at any given time but regardless i would actually love to make a square off video between these two kits here however before i do that there's one more kit i would like to add in order to fully flesh out the full complement of 1990s kits and that would be the Yag Panther kit from Dragon. All three of these kits were out at the same time and all three of them offered certain attributes to the table and it would be interesting to see how all three compare and contrast to one another. However, that's something I'm more or less planning for a potential video in the future after of course I get and build the Dragon Yag Panther counterpart, specifically the one from the 90s. But until then, here you get to see the Italeri and the Arch Nemesis Tamiya version side by side you know, duking out with one another on the table at this time. It's kind of almost like a weigh-in, you know, before a boxing match, if you will. And at the end of the day, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. Tamiya model kits are pretty much considered to be the gold standard on supplying kits that are both excellent with their detail fidelity, but are also very easily assembled and make for an excellent building experience for the builder. And this model here is definitely not an exception to that. And although this one particular example over here did require a little bit of extra work compared to the other kits of the same type, but this again was due to the fact that the model's condition upon the start of the project was a little bit more down the road compared to something that would have been started in a virgin unassembled kit format. Regardless, this model still was able to be built to the following condition that we have here, and this is going to be an excellent addition in my collection. It's definitely one I can't wait to go ahead and put it on display. And this is the perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. So, like I just mentioned before, Tamiya kits are world renowned for being very, very simple, but yet very, very detailed at the same time. Well, does this mean, would I recommend this kit here for someone who's a beginner who's never touched a plastic model kit in their life? And no. <laughs> Although I did mention how these kits are relatively easily built, that doesn't mean this is something I would recommend for someone who's off the boat, who's never touched a plastic model kit before, ever. This is the type of build that you would want to 
tackle after you have a number of builds already under your belt. Something about like half a dozen to about a dozen or so kits. And at that point there, you should have your fundamentals ironed out to then be able to tackle one of these models here. Some of the fundamentals would include things like you know, just removing components off of the sprue, being able to carefully deburr them, working with some smaller, finer detail bits, as well as working with sub-assemblies and even seam removal. Although these mentioned skill sets are relatively easy and should be a no-brainer, if someone is a beginner model builder, they're not exactly going to have all these ducks in a row. And by the time you've already went through about six or 12 builds. At that point, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that you transitioned into the realm from beginner to an intermediate. An intermediate builder, I would recommend this kit all day long. It is phenomenal for that type of an individual. The components build very well, they build very quickly, and the detailing on all the molded bits are very nicely done. Even though this kit here is over 20 years old now, it's still aged very well, and in my opinion, it's just as relevant today as it was back when it was first released back in the mid-1990s. And if an intermediate builder can tackle one of these models, needless to say, so could anyone with an advanced range skill set. In fact, because of the age of this kit and how long it's been on the market, as well as how ubiquitous it's been on the market for as long as it has, chances are really good if you're an advanced range builder and if you're a certain vintage, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised you already built one or a couple of these kits already and they've already been sitting in your collection for some time. Having said that, however, an advanced range builder can definitely tackle one of these models. I would recommend it all day long. However, one of those individuals would probably feel a little bored with working on the model over here just because of how relatively simplistic this kit really is. For someone like that, I would steer them more towards some of the more recent super kit releases from companies like Dragon, I believe Mang or Ryfield may have also created a Yag Panther kit, if I'm not mistaken. However, I do know that there's a plethora of other modern new tooling super kits that are on the market, and those kits are far more advanced compared to this kit over here, and those may be something to look into as opposed to one of these older generation models. Having said that though, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this kit over here, and it's definitely one that makes for an excellent build regardless. One other thing that an advanced builder or even an intermediate builder might want to consider is the fact that this kit, because it's been on the market for as long as it has, there is a ton of aftermarket detail options that are available to upgrade this kit past the condition that we have here. In this video, I did touch upon the PhotoWatch grill covers earlier that I used for this model. However, there is basically anything under the sun in terms of detail hop-ups that can be thrown onto this model here to improve from the kit original. I'm talking about things like workable track links, you have entire replacement suspension sets, entire replacement details, PhotoWatch, cast resin, 3D print, you name it, there's a ton of stuff out there in order to sprinkle onto this model over here to really kick it up to the next level. However, like I often mention in these videos, is this something that's really worth it considering that there are several other super kits out there on the market that more or less already offer these features out of the box? Uh, again, this is something that's best left up to discretion and budget of the builder in mind. But again, if you want to just roll with it out of the box or relatively out of the box like I've done over here, there's again nothing stopping you from doing that as it still builds very well in that format as you can see here. And that's really all there is to be mentioned about that and this brings us to recommendations. Obviously, with the vehicle subject matter, if you're a fan of World War II German armor or you know, as I like to call it, the World War II German zoo, the Jagd Panther here is more than recommended. If you are just a fan of the Panther, and there are a lot of guys out there that just love Panthers, I've met quite a few of them, I cannot recommend this kit enough. Although, chances are really good if you're one of those die-hard Panther fans, Perhaps you're going to find some mistakes with this kit over here, as they always tend to do. And if that's the case, you may want to stick with some of the more modern super kits, like I mentioned in the previous scene. But regardless, if you're into the Panther, yeah, this kit here, it's definitely going to be a no-brainer. Outside of the Panther fanatics, anyone who's just into World War II armor or just Panzer Jaegers are going to be interested in this kit over here. It is a phenomenal example of what the Jag Panther can be in 135, and this kit here builds very well and presents equally as nicely once added to your collection. Because the model is a, to me a kit, this is another person who I would recommend this kit to, as there are people out there that just love to build and collect 
model kits from Tamiya. And obviously this one here scratches both of those check boxes. So yeah, needless to say, this one would be recommended for that type of individual as well. This one here, I can't really say it's a vintage kit or if it classifies as a vintage kit, specifically compared to some of the other ones that I've mentioned before and built on this channel. It's definitely an older tooling kit. However, it's been in constant production now since the mid 1990s. And I really don't, I, I hope Tamiya doesn't scrub this one off the roster as they've done with several of the other kits that they've retooled in the past and messed up by giving them individual Lincoln Link tracks, but you know, that's a story for another video for another day. As for this one here, it's not really a vintage kit, but it's definitely an older tooling kit. And if you're just the type of guy that likes to work on older tooling models, yeah, this one here would definitely fit in your collection pretty well as well. Because of the model subject matter, as well as also with the execution, this one here would also be a good candidate for a diorama setting. The hatches on the rear portion are functional, as I mentioned before, and there is some mild interior detailing. Because of this, there are several full interior options that can be added to this model as an aftermarket set, admittedly. However, that is an avenue that you can possibly add to this model over here in order to better make it suitable for a diorama setting. Tamiya themselves also offers a drop-in engine bay for this particular kit, so this is another option to add to your model in case you want to better suited for a diorama role. Finally, last but certainly not least, the last person I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of just the casemate designs. If you're the type of person that digs vehicles in this type of format, be it the Elephant, the Yag Tiger, ASU-85, KV-14, American T-28 Super Heavy Tank, or the Tortoise, the addition of a Yag Panther Tag collection will fit in absolutely perfectly. And this particular kit over here would be an excellent choice to add to your roster of your case-made vehicles. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale German World War II Jagd Panther tank destroyer. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.